Hi, I'm Madison. And I'm Emily. And welcome back to yet another episode of Booksmart. In this episode, we'll be interviewing Holly Bourne. She has won many prestigious awards for her books. Her books also include themes of mental health and feminism, which I think is really wonderful. And remember, if you want a chance to win one of her books, please leave a comment in the video. Let's roll the interview! Woo! Hi, hello! Hi, how are you? Uh, good, thank you. How are you? Good, yes. I'm really happy to be here today. Thanks for having me into your school. Mm, thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have a few questions for you. Um, yeah. So first one's kind of about, like... Um, one of your main topics in your books, like mental health and everything. So we were just wondering, why do you believe it's so important to kind of raise um, like mental health awareness in your books? Um, so I kind of never explicitly try to write about mental health problems, but they are in all my books because um, I feel like... Um, it's a very normal thing for, unfortunately, for lots of teenagers to go through. And I really, the way that I understand sort of mental health problems is they're usually like a reaction to a world that, you know, is not as healthy as it could be. And so because all my books are sort of focused on trying to um, make the world a better place and try to get teenagers to understand their problems in the kind of wider context in the world that they live in, rather than thinking there's just something inherently wrong with them. Um, that kind of means that, yeah, mental health is always there, because sadly we don't live in the healthiest, happiest society that we could. And I think one of the biggest things books can do is educate people and inspire them. And what I hope my books do is help educate young people about why they're suffering, what might be causing their suffering, giving maybe a name to their suffering or if it's not them maybe something their friends is going through or a family member and then hopefully with that education and knowledge then inspiring them to kind of want to fight for a world that you know leaves less marks on people and you know means that our brains aren't constantly struggling to make sense of all these kind of difficult power structures that we live in or um, inequality or people behaving really badly towards us even though we're trying really hard to be nice and yeah, so it would just be very strange to not write about mental health problems because I think we all struggle. And I think you particularly struggle when you're a teenager because you've kind of just got puberty, you just go... <laughs> in the corner. Yes. And then you've got forced education. You're like, this is a terrible combination, having to go to school with puberty. And I think that... And you're starting to wake up to realising that adults don't really know what they're doing and the world isn't very fair. And it's just like this kind of perfect storm for your brain to just be like, I can't cope with this. I'm going yeah. to get really sad or get really anxious or get both at the same time. And so, yeah, I just try to tell the truth about the teenage experience. And sadly, the teen experience when it comes to mental health can be really challenging. Mm, definitely, yeah. Yeah. I think it's like um, I think it's so important that you write about things like this, and it's important that all authors start to like bring awareness to it because it helps. It helps like people who read the book about it, and like understand perhaps what they might go through in the future or what their friend might go through, and so you can support them um, without being patronizing, I yeah. guess. And it's all it's all all your characters are so relatable. So they it's really, really nice. Are. It's really nice to kind of. You know, it's it's like, oh my gosh, another person's going through this as well. So Yeah, definitely. Know. And I think I read this thing that, because um, teenagers have like synaptic pruning or something, and uh, when you take your GCSEs in England, that's when it's happening. So <laughs> while your brain is literally repairing and making, like, yeah. uh, getting better, it's literally when you have to take you the most important, well, not most important, but, like, really important exams that will shape your future, which seems a bit um, skew if <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> sense. Yeah. So um, how have your own life experiences affected your writing? Um... They obviously, I feel like any writer, whatever they write, of course your life is going to impact the stories you tell because it's you writing them, as it were. But at this point, I've written two, 10 books uh, for teenagers and two books for adults. So I think if I had lived everything that had happened to all my characters, I think I would probably, uh, yeah, not be able to get out of bed in the morning. You know, um, so there's definitely 
not every book I've written has been purely autobiographical. What's really great about being a writer and anyone who's uh, watching this, who wants to be a writer or wants to be creative in any way is you don't have to completely put your whole self into a book, but just living your life and having experiences and then having thoughts or getting angry, those can always fire something. So there's always been something that's happened in my life specifically that's then kind of started um, the idea for a book. So, um, for example, um, in my Spinster Club series, which is a books about feminism, especially in particularly What's a Girl Got to Do?, um, the opening line is, I wasn't even wearing a short skirt. And it's about this girl called Lottie who gets really badly sexually harassed work, walking to college, um, which sadly I hear from young girls all the time, just how much you get harassed, um, even when you're in school with school uniform. And, you know, and I found that really scary. And that gave me the idea for that opening scene. And then, you know, that character came. Or my most recent book, which is called The Yearbook, which is um, about a girl called Paige who kind of decides to start telling the truth about how horrible people are at school. Um, that kind of came into my life because at my school, when I was younger, um, there was a kind of group of bullies who, before the yearbook went to press, changed the yearbook mm. and put some really horrible things in there about people. Mm. And I think anti-bullying policy was very bad in the 90s and the early noughties because nothing ever really happens. And I remember that has always really bothered me that nobody was ever held accountable. So 15 years later, I was like, right, I'm going to hold them accountable through fiction. So there's always little nuggets of my life, my thoughts, things that I can remember that kind of, if you kind of realize, oh, this is gnawing at me a little bit. That usually is the beginning of a creative idea. And um, and yet, as I said, anyone who wants to write or about stories or poems, um, just realize when you're kind of can't get over something, <laughs> which is kind of a bit like, oh, I should really just get on with my life. Like, it wasn't that big a deal. And if you can't, that's usually where a story is because um, there's something to explore there. And yeah, so none of my books are complete autobiographical autobiographies but a lot of little bits and pieces from my life kind of start them cool um we were just wondering also in your um talk about your series of books um the spinster club um uh, lottie and amber and evie they always have some kind of like cheesy snack on the go we were just wondering kind of what kind of would be your favorite snack for brain power when you're writing or something so this is one of the things I get asked a lot, and I'm not a huge fan of cheesy snacks. Again, it's one of those things that my characters are, are not me. Um, I remember my friend, I once dared, I think it's because I once dared, up, we once all dared my friend Rachel to eat 20 bags of Watsits when we were 15. Oh and she was sick. <laughs> and then, I'm just kind of traumatised whenever I see Watsits because I just remember like the vomit that came out of my mouth. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, that's really foul. Um so yeah, I know I'm more of a chocolate person rather than a cheese person. You know, when people start to give you cheese rather than chocolate cake at parties and stuff, I'm like, what? No, this is unacceptable. <laughs> but, um, what I hoped those books um, really celebrated, I do remember the joy of when girls will get together mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Or after school and how snacks are a really important part of that. And me and my friends, Patty, were really into dip. So we just buy loads of different tubs of dip and loads of different things. And we would, and it's just like this kind of glorious feast of kind of really bad for you food. And then you're yes. just kind of groaning at each other lying on the sofa. I, I feel like you don't see girls eat enough in yeah. book, in film, um, whereas food's actually usually a real source of joy and to get coming togetherness yeah. um, when you're a teenager. So I, I kind of really wanted to get food into that, that, that book. <laughs> yeah. What is your favourite word or phrase to put in a book? And do you think that's character sp specific? So, like, if you have a character that would, like, um, use, like, slang or whatever, do you have a phrase that they use a lot, or is it just in your writing? Um, I'm very wary of using slang, um, just because I get older over a year, um, <laughs> and I've been doing this job for almost 10 years now, and it, whereas my readership there's lots of people who carry on reading my books even when they're not teenagers anymore but I have new teenagers who are finding my books as they sort of grow up and so I'm always very wary of using slang just because you just don't want to be that old person trying to understand <laughs> so I'm just yeah. like I'm just gonna 
you know, TikTok's your thing. You could just go over there and do it. And I'm just going to not be trying grandma maybe <laughs> film of me dancing for you um so i'm always wary of slang i do have a word motto my favorite this is a bit um of a weird one but a, a word that i love just because it makes me laugh so much is the word loins <laughs> um and i do actually try to get that word into most of my books it's like a little joke for myself so now if you're ever reading in my book what for the word loins because it's just purely funny um <laughs> And I remember when I was a university student and we had to get served to this horrible dinner every night. And um, every Thursday it was loin of cod. And I just thought that a cod had a loin. It just made me like break up. And I was always <laughs> laughing so hard I couldn't order my food. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Okay, so um, next question. It's kind of a bit of a weird kind of uh, wacky one. But um, <laughs> if you were stuck on a desert island and you could take five items with you, what would you take? Oh dear. Um, five. I'm trying to think. I'm like I'm such. The thought of being on a desert island alone makes me because I'm a very chatty person makes me just feel so awful. But all I can think is I'll bring five things, which means I don't have to stay on the island. <laughs> like a boat. I will, bring a, I will bring a plane so I can leave. <laughs> um, but if that wasn't an option, um, I'd love to bring my entire book collection um if that counts as one and because i have this problem where i'm sure everyone who, anyone who loves reading gets it there's just there's so many books that i have in my house that i want to yeah. read and then i always buy myself new books before i finish the pile and then there's just so it'd be really good to just catch up so when i'm rescued i'd be like finally i don't have this pile of books haunting me um i would um, really like some corn cocktail sausages. They're like my favourite. Oh, I love them. Yeah, so like good. <laughs> you can never just have like wood. You always have to have the whole pack. Yes. Um, I would have my cat, who's my favourite thing. She's just asleep. Oh, she's not. She's gone. And um, feet, uh, my feet. And um, uh, what else? I think it's probably some suntan lotion because I burn very easily. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, a whistle to call for help because I think that's, once I finish reading, I'll be smart. like, "Hang okay, man." Idea. <laughs> that's so true with like book collection. I always have like at least five books somewhere that I yes. I need to get to, or there's just too many books and I don't know where to put them all because I I need to read them. <laughs> yeah, um. So this is kind of a weird one as well, but like um. Um, yeah, so what are your top two, if you were to pick two top two songs or top two genres, which ones would they be for music? Top two songs? It's probably, so I really like storytelling music. So um, songs where I feel like the songwriter is really telling a story, like obviously like songs that are really fun to dance to and all that sort of stuff, but like to me, and that's usually country type people who have kind of come out of country music, who are now mainstream, usually are the best retailers. So I'm a real Taylor Swift fan. Yeah. Yes. Um, just because I think, A, I kind of feel like if she was a man, she would get a lot more respect for like her level of skill. And because yeah, her storytelling in her songs is just second to none. Um, I know I have a friend who's an English teacher who teaches Taylor Swift songs. Um, in her lessons to kind of be like look this is really good <laughs> and so she's written a song called All Too Well mm -hmm. which is a very famous song of hers that I love just because if you look at the narrative structure and how she changes from first person to second person halfway through like this is where I geek out so that's that good and then I'm also a really big fan of this guy called Bruce Springsteen who I promise if you get into will change your life um <laughs> People call it falling into the Bruce hole once you've found his music. <laughs> um, you just kind of don't listen to anything else for about six months and you just realise that this man understands the world in a way that you never could. And, um, yeah, he's got a really good song called Dancing in the Dark, which I think if you're a teenager, you would love that song. Although I know that older people are always trying to get you to listen to all, all the music, but yeah, he was old when I was there. And Dancing in the Dark is this incredible song that highlights that feeling of feeling bored and stuck in your in the mud of your life, and you just want to escape and run away, and you just need this like spark to just get out of yourself. I just think it's an incredible song. So those two. Love that. 
Yeah, <laughs> I certainly relate in terms of like looking into lyrics and stuff. That you know, yeah. when you actually, my parents always be like, oh, you always overanalyze everything, but it's actually kind of a lot of songs have a deeper meaning, which is Definitely. quite nice to get into. I like the songs that sound like like the melody or whatever is like really happy or whatever and then when you read the lyrics you're yeah. like oh my god but it's amazing <laughs> but it's amazing yeah. and i love it it's it's great <laughs> yeah it's so good anyway um in terms of the next question is kind of touching more on um another theme in your books which is kind of feminism um which you've recently actually been studying in english yeah we? yeah um so what are your top tips as a feminist for pointing out sexism in the world um, well, my top tips are pointing out sexism. I guess the number one tip is accept the fact that people aren't going to like you doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is part of the work. Um, so, yeah, it's about just it, like the way that I sort of always see it. It's very, very simple, but it's just kind of like, would this be happening to boys? Um, and then sometimes it's like worth, there's obviously bad things happen to boys that are differently, but a lot of the time it's disproportionately. So we're kind of a bit like, you know, is, is this something they need to worry about? You know, <laughs> do they feel safe walking home? You know, all this sort of stuff. So that is a good way to kind of scan for information and know that people aren't going to like you pointing it out. And then the one thing that I would think is really important about feminism is there's only so much you can achieve yeah. by just yelling at people who don't agree with you on the internet. And actually, the, um, there's so much work that can be done if you want to be a feminist, which is about you know fundraising for women's issues that really need you or kind of um you know complaining to your local mp like my local mp hates me i'm literally always sending your emails going what about this you know they literally have to reply to your email they have to so it's it's lobbying it's doing charity work so i've done lots of work with women's aid about abusive relationships it's sort of and that actually i think helps you feel like you're doing something more than when you're kind of screw- trying to get somebody to care who really doesn't want to care and who's just calling you horrible stuff, either to your face or online. And so it's sort of just like calling out is really important, but I feel sometimes with feminism, it's about just going and doing, you know, doing the stuff and um, getting to know women and girls who have different lives than you or have problems that you haven't considered and trying to help those. I think that is really beneficial. And yeah, know that we just look out for each other um, especially if you're, you know, girls and feminists, it's just, it's so easy to see each other as the enemy. Um, we've got so much internalized misogyny and we really just need to support each other and uplift each other. And it doesn't mean we have to agree with everything that the other person says. Mm. And I think a lot of feminism is you kind of, well, I'm a feminist and I'm doing this. And sometimes I'm like, I don't really agree that that is, you know, but it's yeah. rather than you're allowed to not completely agree yeah. um, and discuss and debate. And that's actually where change happens. I've had my mind change loads um, by just having conversations with feminists who are friends, it, politely and kindly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. agree with. And yeah. hopefully I've yeah. gone to them and I'm like, oh, you know, you say you're doing this and you feel empowered, but actually why are you doing this? And you can only have that if you're not screaming at each other and saying you're doing it wrong. Because uh, it's you've got lots of people just going, you're a belief explicitive, you know, <laughs> you hate men and you're disgusting and blah, blah, blah. So it's like you really get enough from the people who aren't yeah. a feminist at all and think that feminism is like this undercover, you know, um, mission to chain all men to the walls and for us to reign, which it is. And so it's like, don't, don't argue with the sisterhood try and learn from each other yeah. in a healthy nice place well, like, and to actually do some work yeah there's like a lot of stuff that's like can you be a feminist and do this but it's like it's important to like contradictions yeah. in people is really important and having different opinions is part of what's important to feminism like you should be allowed to have different opinions to each other but you're all trying to reach a goal of equality with all sexes I think so just because you might disagree with the beliefs of someone else who's who's also fighting for equality or whatever it doesn't you know it doesn't mean you have to like shout at them to make them believe what you believe yeah and it's I always say look criticize the power structure not the person trapped in the power structure and so some people you, you could even say with makeup 
you know, like lots of feminists disagree about whether or not it's empowering or disempowering. And it's like, rather than screaming at somebody for wearing makeup, um, it's look at the power structures, look at impossible beauty standards, look at the cosmetic industry, look at how they advertise things, look at photoshopped images on Instagram, and the fact that lots of people use filters all the time and they can't even legally have to declare it. You know, those are those are the things to go for rather than your mate who's wearing a bit of foundation because she feels like she can't show her spots because society has made her feel that those are disgusting. It's like yeah. criticise the society, not the person, and dismantle that. And then maybe this friend who's saying, I actually feel really empowered because of this thing. Yeah fight to remove the things and then they might not wear it and they might still but you won't know until you get rid of the like yeah. the power also, like if it helps someone's self-esteem or something to be wearing that a bit of a layer of foundation i don't think they should be criticized for it but then it's yeah what you said yeah yeah we're all doing the best we can when it's um the analogy that i use a lot of time with patriarchy and it's it's worth saying that as i said boys are you know, fall victim to patriarchy too, is I kind of say, using the analogy of like a pickle jar. <laughs> and we're all just like pickles floating in this big jar of brine and the brine is like the patriarchy. And feminism is about realizing that we're all trapped in this jar. And so it's about waking up to realize, oh, we're in this jar and you're trying to get all the other pickles to kind of throw yourselves against the jar so you can like topple it and smash and be free. But in the time that you're doing that, you're still absorbing that juice we're all kind of slowly being pickled and so it's always you know just like so we're, so we're gonna have be insecure about the way we look and we're gonna maybe want a really big white wedding um because that's all we've ever been to. you know we're gonna you know because we've got the juice and so it's um you know none of us can be this perfect feminist or this perfect yeah. ally because we're all trapped in the jar <laughs> and until we've smashed it um we're you know so it's just yeah that's a really yeah. weird analogy, but it works for me. It's a good analogy. It's a good one. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. Um, again, about about feminism. Uh, what do you believe is kind of the next step or steps uh, to achieving equality between men and women? Um, what has been really interesting to see what's coming out in the last couple of years is um, violence against women and girls. Um, I work with Women's Aid and the book, The Places I Cried in Public, that I wrote was all about um, the sort of normalised, um, uh, the normalisation of abuse in teenage relationships. And I see that as the most pressing and urgent thing to tackle because not feeling safe and being traumatised and a level in which girls and women are traumatised, I think clips your wings in so many ways um, that it's, it's kind of almost impossible to reach true, you know, the true power of you if you're scared or you're, you're not safe or, um, and all these things are happening. So I feel like there's more and more research is coming out that's just kind of starting to underpin what feminists have been trying to say for ages, which is like the sheer scale of violence against women and how normal it is and how it's not held accountable and I think it's been really interesting to see how students, schoolgirls and boys are talking about um, sexual harassment in schools. I know that that's been in the news a lot and with this everyone's invited story. And then we've had the Sarah Everett vigils and yeah. the kind of huge public outpouring. And I, I really hope that we're at, in a time where violence against girls and women is taking really seriously and tr looking into how to stop it and how to stop normalizing it. Cause it's, what could we achieve if we weren't terrified yeah. all the time? And it's, you know, you leave your house and you walk down the street and it's not up to you whether or not somebody tells you, says to yell something gross at you, or you're trying to learn in a lesson and somebody's, I remember at my school pinging my bra strap, but it's just, you know, I'm like, I'm trying to learn. And, yeah. and then this is never held accountable and, and it's, it's disgusting and yeah so um sorry it's really dark thing to finish on as a final question um but that to me is the most important thing and um and also acknowledging that boys are victims of male violence too Definitely. so it's tackling male violence and how it's just harming all of us i think Definitely. would help education it would help mental health it would probably help the environment it would help uh 
you know, women going into work and how well they did. It's just like, it would just, if you kind of sold to violence, I think it would solve lots of other things. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. And there's like stuff that's, oh yeah, that happened to you, but it's normal. It happens to everyone. Like deal with it kind of thing needs to kind of go, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was also really normal, like, not very many hundreds of years ago for, like, the king to just, like, chop his wife's heads off. Yeah. Like, that was yeah. normal. Like, things change. <laughs> like, Definitely. you know, imagine if Prince William now was like, you know what, Kate, I found this younger 15-year-old I want to marry. Like, <laughs> I'm going to lock you in a tower and then everyone's going to watch on television if you're publicly beheaded. Like, we're yes. just like, oh, it's getting good. It's totally normal. Like, it's just because things used to be normal does it mean that they are okay? Definitely. Yeah. yeah, it's horrible. And there's kind of like this um, attitude, you know, if a woman gets raped with a, of a, like when in a room of like four men, you know, they're oh God, yeah, rape is awful, but what was she doing in a room with four men, you know, yeah. rather than why the hell did they do that? So or like if a girl wears a, uh, wears a skirt out mm. and gets harassed, oh, she was asking for it because she was wearing a skirt mm. and it just doesn't, doesn't feel right. Like you should be able to control yourself if that makes yeah. sense yeah it doesn't and uh, the way that we see uh, um violence against girls doesn't actually uh paint boys in very good light they yeah. should be just as upset you know they're now yeah. saying you know that four-year-old girls should wear shorts so that their modesty is protected when they do cartwheels in the playground and you're like who's looking at a four-year-old girl and thinking yeah. everything but like this is a child play yeah. you're like if people more credit than that like do you really yeah. think boys and men are just these like foul perverts who can't yeah. help yeah. themselves like it's demeaning and bad but it makes me so happy to be having this conversation with you I'm like yes young people are great like they get it <laughs> and they're oh, gonna good. fight yeah. and um I hope that yeah my writing has helped inspire some of you over mm, to start really having nice. I, I love your writing <laughs> yes it's so good. absolutely awesome and Thank I just you. got um, the yearbook in yeah, the post. Yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. So I started reading it, so that's so good. I'm very excited. <laughs> anyway, oh, thank you so much, much for having us. Um, yes. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for thank doing this. Thank you so much. And yeah, just keep reading and yeah, good luck with all this COVID life that you have. I feel so good <laughs> yeah. to be with yes. you right now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> So Madsen, what was it like interviewing Holly Bourne? Because I know you're a huge fan of hers, so... It was really lovely to um, talk with Holly Bourne because I read a lot of her books and it's very interesting to find the insights of the person behind all the words you've written and the inspiration um, behind them. And it, it, yeah, it was just a wonderful opportunity. Oh, I'm glad. Shall we see the book recommendations from our friends? Awesome. Let's go. Hello. I'd like to recommend to you one of my favourite books called I Am Not a Number by Liza Heath Field. The book is a piece of historical fiction and follows the story of a young girl named Ruby when she goes to a concentration camp. I would recommend this book for anyone looking for a thought-provoking read as I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Melissa and I would like to recommend The Darkest Minds by Alexandra Bracken. The story follows Ruby who lives in the dystopian world where a mysterious disease has killed most of America's children. The children who survive are left with frightening abilities they can't control. I would really recommend this book because this is a thriller and this is very gripping. For this month's book smart, I'd like to recommend you guys Throne of Glass. It's a gripping fantasy novel that I think you'd all enjoy. Oh, and by the way, um, if you want the chance to win one of Holly Bourne's books, remember to leave a comment down below with the hashtag BookSmart. Thank you so much for watching this episode and we'll see you next time. Bye! Bye.